All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Sarah Cabot. We're at 12th and Maple in Dundee. It's April 27, 2021. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Uh, the first question for you, why wine? Yeah, wow. Um, <laughs> so my undergraduate uh, degree is, is in jazz composition from Berklee College of Music in Boston. And uh, so it's very unrelated field or some people find are able to draw parallels between music and especially composition. But anyhow, uh, when I was in school there, I was working in restaurants to pay the bills. And um, I just got really fortunate actually to my first restaurant job was at a um, Mediterranean bistro in Central Square in Cambridge called Central Kitchen. And the wine steward there was very geeky. He's now like a like tippity top psalm in Boston. Um, and he was really proactive about educating the staff. So we got to, you know, taste and learn about all of the wines on the menu. Anytime anything changed, we did wine tastings a couple times a week and um, my, you know, my dad's a scientist and was a high school science teacher when I was a kid and then was a, uh, went back and got his, his master's in physics and then went back and got his doctorate in education and policy with an emphasis on science. So I like geeky things. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, being that it was a Mediterranean bistro, it was very Southern French, Spanish, Portuguese list, mostly Southern French. And, um, you know, I loved all of the information and I loved the labels, I loved the nuances, but the wines themselves were a little rustic. And then he decided to bring in the wine that kind of started it all for me, which it's a little shameful. My, obviously my palate's become a little bit more discerning, <laughs> but um, it was a 1996 Hartley Ostini Hitching Post Santa Barbara County Pinot Noir. And it tasted like candy <laughs> compared to these bready Southern French wines. And I was like, I love Pinot Noir. So it just kind of stuck. I just, you know, once I, I tasted that one and then as I moved on to actual fine dining from there, um, I, I really kind of just, the grape kind of stuck with me, that varietal. And of course, you know, I, I ended up down the road, I got certified as a psalm, and I ended up really falling in love with like weird orange wines and oxidized whites and all the geeky shit that psalms like. But, um, but Pino had this, I don't know, this sort of glamor about it or, or like a um, elusiveness to it. And, and so once I started learning about the varietal, then, you know, I spent time delving into French, you know, Burgundies, and then um, just learning about all the different regions. And so over the course of my time selling wines, um, I definitely, you know, I had the opportunity to meet suppliers and visit a few wineries. And I, um, I was a Somme in, in Seattle and a bartender at Wild Ginger. And it's funny, I made their, their private label Pinot Noir now. I, I make their Pinot Noir, it's great, it's awesome. Um, so I was there and they have this phenomenal cellar. Like it's like a 3000 bottle cellar or something like that. It's, uh, and it's really geeky and cool. So by then I had already figured out that my, my real love when it came to Pinot was domestic and more specifically cool climate. So that's mainly Oregon. You could also sort of classify the Okanagan in there. Mm -hmm. um, and then like Mendocino, Anderson Valley. Mm -hmm. Sonoma Coast, depending on the place. I, I definitely have a wine boner for Hirsch Vineyards, for sure. <laughs> um, so working in the front of the house, uh, I kind of grew out of it, I guess. I'm, I love humans, and I wish everyone a happy life, but I, I'm not necessarily the best at, you know, day after day serving them. Um, especially, you know, when, you, when you're in a fine dining situation, there's, there's a heightened level of expectation 
of, of your servitude. And, um, and I would kind of run out of patience with that. And then there was also this sort of cyclical aspect of just the, you know, set it up, break it down, set it up, mm -hmm. break it down. And, um, and the pretentious rich people ordering the absolutely wrong bottle for their meal, and you're just like, what are you doing? This is seven flavor beef. You want to have Riesling, not Screaming Eagle, but. Um, <laughs> so I was complaining to our head, Sam, and he's like, you know, there's a school here you could go get a degree in winemaking. And I was like, get the fuck out of town. <laughs> so so I, I went to, um, to check out the program at South Seattle Community College. It's just it's very, just like the Chemeketa program we have here. Um, so it's like a two and a half to three year um, Applied Associates of Science in Enology and Viticulture. And being that my bachelor's was in a non-hard science. I had to do some prerequisites before I could even get into the program. So I w actually went through the University of Washington because I'm a legacy because my dad, so it was cheap. Um, and I had to do all the like OCHEM and, you know, microbio and all that stuff, which was awful. But I made it through, passed all the classes, and then, um, then yeah, I, I went back to school. and. Um, it's a great program. It was still, it was about seven years old by the time I went there. Um, and they've got a great little teaching winery. Uh, everything's really small and cute and little cute small fermenters and, um, but it's pretty well equipped. And there's, a, they had a lot of um, guest instruction that, and some of those people were really, really knowledgeable. And then we'd had a lot of partnership um, classes, especially when we would go out to the vineyards mm -hmm. with um, Washington State uh, with their mm -hmm. fermentation science program. So it was, it was a great experience and, um, and it was, I swear it was like day one, I was like, oh yeah, this is, this is what I want to do. <laughs> this is way better than opening stupid bottles for rich people, <laughs> which I still actually do, but you know, but I have all the power now. <laughs> and so, um, so yeah, so I, I th being that it, it was in Seattle, we were working with Washington fruit. Mm -hmm. So uh, Cabernet, Syrah, Merlot, a um, little bit of Grenache, little Cab Franc, Chardonnay, uh, Pinot Gris, but they called it Pinot Grigio, and um, Sauvignon Blanc. And so I still, during that whole time, you know, I still had this, this Pinot thing, and I, I still, I honestly don't know if it's just that at the time that I tried that Santa Barbara County, I was 19 and basically still a kid, and it, it really did taste like candy compared to the Southern French wines, and, and it just, like it changed some chemistry in my brain or something, and I'm like, this is my varietal, but um, there were definitely times, you know, once I moved down to Oregon to actually do it, that I was like, what have I done? Like 2007, for example, <laughs> or 2011. Mm -hmm. 2011. Oh my God, that's mm -hmm. hell. Yeah. Still, uh, still easier to deal with in 2020. But um, yeah, so it just. I think what I fell in love with right away and has remained true for me in in wine growing and production is that it appeals to all of the sides of me. There's this side of me that's very, I like to build things and I like to play contact sports and I like things to be intense and rough and challenging, you know, and so that's definitely a part of this. Mm -hmm. Like you have to be able to think on your feet. You have to be a good problem solver. You have to be resourceful and you have to be willing to take a physical beating and not stop until it's done. Mm -hmm because that's how fermentation is. You get one chance every year. And so that I get this sort of, I get this thrill from harvest, from the long hours and the stress and the intensity and the camaraderie, the bonds that you build with your fellow cellar hands. And so, um, so that's, that really works for me. And, but then there's also this very artistic side of it. There's that, there's this, you know, 
the connection with the vineyard and how to express the fruit properly and like what are the best ways to conduct a fermentation and like what's the most pure way to do it and like what does all this dogma mean and how important is it to like stick to the dogma and you know there's just there's a lot of artistry that goes into it and um, and there's I also, you know, I partially grew up on a small island in, in the San Juans. My parents have been divorced since I was two, and I was very lucky. They always got along really well. So they shared custody. So my mom has lived out on Waldron for years, and uh, out there it's off grid, and it's 95 people. Um, and so it's very like dirty knees, and you gotta build it yourself, and playing on the beach, and climbing trees. And so, the connection with the, the natural world that I get through VIT has been really meaningful. Um, and, and then the geeky side, you know, that's totally, the, the geeky side of me that loves to bake mm -hmm. is, it's that same, that same thing, right? It's, it's um, you know, you, you have this ecosystem in a fermenter and you have so much control and then there's so much that is not within your control, or you think you control it, but if it's Pinot, you don't. <laughs> and um, just, you know, dealing with this tank full of grapes and little microbial guys, you know, and, and like how to cultivate this, this little world you know, and, and get it into a bottle and, and, um, and then pour it for somebody and with their food. And it's just, it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it feels, sometimes it feels like otherworldly, you know, it, it feels like, a, like something out of a fairy tale. Um, so, you know, and then like I had already gotten really geeky as a psalm and so, I, you know, I had the opportunity as once I became a, a, a head winemaker, I had the opportunity to, to do all these things that I had been so curious about, like get amphorae and try whole cluster ferments and try partial whole cluster ferments. And do I want a cold soak? Do I not want a cold soak? Do I want to go no new oak? Do I want to go 100% new oak? You know, um, it's just like all the things that I was curious about. I, I just, it, it's been trials and trials and trials. And I still do trials every year because there's always something new that I'm curious about. You know, some, I hear from somebody that they did this thing, and I want to try that. Like, so 2020 was definitely full of trials mm -hmm. and tribulations. Mm -hmm. um, but it, yeah, man, it's, I, from the first day that I went to class, like Enology 101, to right now, it's, I've never looked back. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. not even a little bit. Um, and that my whole career has kind of fallen into place very serendipitously. Like, I, I couldn't make it up. It's been so serendipitous. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's been really fortunate. You know, my first job in, in Oregon was I uh, worked harvest for Brian at Belle Pont. And, um, and when I made the decision to move down here to do that, you know, harvest is, I mean, you have maybe eight weeks, and then who knows what after that, and I, I had to make this choice, you know, I was making really good money at Wild Ginger, and had a nice little apartment and stuff, and, and I had to decide, you know, okay, I'm just going to sell everything I own that doesn't fit in my car, and if I can't find another job in production when that harvest is over. I'll just work in a restaurant in Portland until I can. And so that's what I did. And the day that I finally made the decision and gave my notice to Wild Ginger, I came home from work that night and there was an email <laughs> from Brian saying, oh, by the way, my assistant winemaker is gonna be moving on after this harvest, so that position's gonna be open. Serendipity. Crazy, right? And so then, you know, I was there for three years, or like two, three harvests, and um, and then I wanted to go work in New Zealand, of course, because as you do. Mm -hmm. And so I got a 
gig there at Akarua because the winemaker at Akarua had been the assistant winemaker at Elk Cove and I'd gotten to know Adam through Brian and so that was actually pretty easy to put together and but I you know I left Belpont to do it because I was going to be gone for a whole like chunk you know three months and so again I had to make this decision with with this very like open end and I went down there and I was just like, okay, I'm gonna figure it out when I get back. It's gonna be okay. You know, I'll get back in whatever May and it'll be fine and I'll have time to find something before harvest. So I'm down there and Willa Kenzie posts the assistant winemaker position. And I'm in New Zealand, like in central Otago with like one computer in the winery office that actually like, this was, bef you know, this was years ago. So, um, so I, yeah, that was two, 2010 mm -hmm. and so um, so I'm like send my CV to Willa Kenzie and then some emails back and forth and then I do a phone interview and they're like okay well, we want to get you in for an in-person interview as soon as you get back so I it was like two days after I got back from New Zealand I went in for the in-person and then two days after that they hired me I, like I, it was bananas, just crazy, right? And um, and then I then Omero was happening on the side, like sh you know after a year at Willa Kenzie. My um, boyfriend at the time and I got married, and his family in, invested in a 50-acre property on Ribbon Ridge, and they were like, "Here's results, partners. Sarah, tell them what you want." I'm just like, <laughs> it's like okay then. <laughs> um, so we planted the vineyard, and um, while we were waiting for the vineyard to produce, we bought a little fruit from Kathy Redman and from Coates and Whitney. And my first, actually, my first production for Omero Cellars was um, fruit that I begged off of Harry Peterson Nedry from Corral Creek. And I had to like nag the crap out of him. Like, and it, I, I was like shameless. I mean, I seriously like almost got on my knees because I really wanted that fruit, you know? <laughs> so he, yeah, he sold me a ton. So my first production was 50 cases. I did it at Belpont. And then, um, and then I did the second vintage there too, I think. And then the third vintage I did at Redmond Winery. We just leased the space from her while I was at Willa Kenzie. So it was this like middle of the night gorilla wine making shit. And then, um, then the vineyard came into production. And so, I don't know if I might be skipping, any, there might be an, another year at Redmond, I have to remember. But uh, basically in 2012, we had enough fruit that I needed to be dedicated and we needed a bigger facility. And so I um, left Willa Kenzie and we got space at the Carlton Winemaker Studio. And so, uh, so I made I made the Omero wines there, and that's when I really got to start experimenting with mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. you know, because I had some white varietals, and um, I had to buy all the things I needed, right? So, I, so I could really, you know, okay, I want to do some some barrel ferments, and I, I want to like I want to use a couple of like I had already gotten to the come to the conclusion at that point that fermenting in a macro bin was not the best way to do it per my needs. <laughs> um, it's just, it's a temperature thing, right? Like I, I, as, as my winemaking style or my priorities have developed, um, I, it's for me the, the two most important aspects of fermentation management are temperature control and gas exchange. And all the rest of it, like the yeast and the sulfites and all that stuff is, you know, meh. If you've got your temperature control down and your gas exchange down and you have good fruit, you may be fine. And I feel like temperature control in a plastic box is tough. Mm -hmm. Even with a plate or a coil, it's just not the same as having a jacket. Um, so, yeah, I really, that was a steep learning curve because I didn't have, I was running the show, and I had been an assistant winemaker at that point for you know six years, but 
but I hadn't run the show. I hadn't been the one making the decisions. I'd been implementing the decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, I'm a perfectionist, and it was nerve-wracking. And there were a few, there were a few mistakes, but uh, only a little bit of it went down the drain. Honestly, like, you know, considering how much I brought in, it was, you know, maybe 0.5 percent that ever ended up being too mm -hmm. crappy to. You know, and, and now, like, if I were to have something like that happen, I, I can lose it in a 95,000 gallon blend, so it's fine, but, um, yeah, but it, it was, that was a really formative time. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I've just gone way off. Uh, so, you asked me why wine, I think I answered it. <laughs> I think you did. <laughs> I'm sorry. And I have, no, 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 no. This is perfect. I will come back and I have many questions that you that you raised here. But I, I am curious. Before we get back into wine, what was your plan before wine? What was your plan with with Berkeley School of Music and, and jazz composition? So I, yeah, I'm a singer, and I wanted. I felt like composition was a more academic sort of a degree and coming from a family of academics, I felt like I needed an academic sounding degree rather than getting a degree in jazz performance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but really what I wanted to do was be a singer. And um, I found, you know, Boston's tough, it's full of music schools and New York is even harder. And I am shy, so I'm not super good at networking. Mm -hmm. And I also really lack that what I think is a necessary gift in that field for shameless self-promotion. I'm just not good at it. Um, so it just, I, that beca it became apparent that the, the, the tools or the, the characteristics necessary to make a career as a jazz singer mm -hmm. what, were tools that I did not possess. Mm -hmm. and, and, I would have had to sell my soul to get them, and I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. So I considered, I actually applied to the University of Washington for a master's in ethnomusicology. And when I went to sit down with the person who was going to be my advisor for the program, you know, we finally got to meet and talk, and he, you know, got a better idea of what I wanted. He was like, oh. <laughs> You're not gonna have fun in this program, because <laughs> in, in my head I'm like, okay, I just want to travel all over the world and hang out with people who make their native music and like take pictures of them and transcribe what they're doing. So it was basically this cross between being like a National Geo Geographic like photographer and a musician. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that's not what ethnomusicologists do. He's like, it's basically research, like. You write grant proposals, and you read grant proposals, and you read papers, and you do research. And I was like, oh, that sounds boring. <laughs> so, uh, so I ended up not doing that, and I, um, I moved back to Seattle for my, my stepfather, my, my sister's father was ill and ended up passing away, and so I, I moved back to be closer to my mom and my sister. And so I was working in restaurants. And then I ended up going to South Seattle to get uh, Applied Associates of Science in Landscape Horticulture. And I had a little landscaping company for a while. Um, and that was fun. That was, it was good. I, I like, uh, I got a really nice little customer base, client base on Mercer Island, which is like mm -hmm. the Lake Oswego of Seattle. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then it got to the point where I had more work than I could do. And so it was going to be either like do all the paperwork, like I had a business license, but when you're one person, that's all you need is a little business license. But when you're going to have employees, mm -hmm. it's a whole other thing. And I mm -hmm. just didn't. I didn't want to, and so um, I sold most of my tools and my client list to another landscaper and just uh, got certified as a SOM, spent more time in restaurants, doing SOM things and restaurant things, and, um, and, then, and then that kind of brought me to the point where, where I went back to school to make wine. That's a really interesting path to winemaking. Yeah, yeah, but it's sort of it, like, 
there's the art and then there's the the farming, mm -hmm. right? And it kind of all like mm -hmm. yeah. So I want to start with your with your psalm education. I'm curious since that was kind of the first thing was was sort of psalm work and, and, and restaurant work. Tell me about that the process of, of education for you as becoming a certified psalm and, and what, what what it was like learning wine kind of from that perspective first. Well, I um, I definitely learned that there is a vast vast breadth of douchebaggery in the restaurant industry. And most of them are psalms. Mm -hmm. um, but not all of them, some of them are really cool. But <laughs> uh, yeah, the quartermaster's process for your level one is not that big of a deal. I mean, you, you know, you study, you know, they tell you what to study, you study it, and then you go take your test and then Bob's your uncle, right? So um, what, I, what I really liked about psalming was actually not, sometimes it was dealing with the customers, sometimes. Like, sometimes you get that person who's like, I'm really excited about these dishes on the menu. Let's, let's get a wine that's gonna, you know, that's super fun, I love that. Because for me, if you think about the history of wine, especially in, some, in the most like prominent wine regions, like in France and Italy, it's, it's been the regional wines were the thing that went with the regional cheese and the regional meat and the regional bread. Mm -hmm. And it's this, this is how, this is what we drink to wash those things down. And it's this very jovial family farmer, you know, experience that when I spent time over there, um, oh, I didn't mention that. So <laughs> after high school, I went to UC Santa Barbara to play soccer, but I hated it there. So I left after soccer season and um, I, I just, it's beautiful, Santa Barbara's gorgeous. It just, I was not rich and blonde and I felt very out of place and I didn't have the right clothes and I didn't have a lot of money and they were mean. So, <laughs> so I left, maybe I was a little sensitive, but um, so I left and I went to Europe for a year with a backpack. And so that's, that was, where I had the non-academic introduction to the world of wine. Mm -hmm. And it was very, it was a very loving and familial introduction. Um, I found it easier to be a little more gregarious when I was in Europe because it was just so exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, my, half my family is Italian, so uh, I had the, um, the language that's in Spain and Italy in particular, the language came pretty easy. Um, but the, yeah, the, the experience with wine there kind of came, in, I was mostly usually looking for cheese. <laughs> and then like, you'd go to the place with the cheese and there'd be the meat, which was also really wonderful usually, and then there'd be the wine, because they would just, that's what you have. And so I, I it, that was really my introduction to it. You know, I, my family didn't, they weren't big drinkers, so there wasn't really wine around as, as a kid, so. But it was, they're, they're so cavalier about it in, in Europe, because it's just part of the meal. Mm -hmm. And so it always was this, was a very food and company oriented thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so then that, that really, that really translated um, to being a psalm because you're helping people pair. So that part of the customer interface was really fun. Mm -hmm. But mostly what I liked was being with my coworkers and doing blind tastings. Because now we get back to being competitive and academic. <laughs> Can I pick out the region? Old world, new world, you know? Um, okay, new world, all right. Are we you know, U.S. continent, or um, is it, is it, you know, New Zealand, is it Australia, is it Canada, you know, and, or South, South America, I mean, and, and so then, you know, you learn about, like, the history of Carignan, the history of Carmenere, and, like, how, you know, the history of Phylloxera, and why is this made here now, and why are these on rootstock, but these are not, and all of that stuff, that was, 
what got me excited enough about wine to go ahead and get the pin, mm -hmm. which I don't, I lost it years ago. Like, that's how much of an impact it really made on it. But it, that process, the quarter master's process, and I think there's like, the, now with the W set and all of these other, I, that are way better, I guess it's sort of, by definition, I mean, you think of the name Court of Masters, like, please. So, it, the pretentiousness was a little much, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so my experience was a little mixed. Like, I loved a lot of what, most, almost all of what we were studying. And I loved knowing more. And I really loved being able to, um, to identify regions, varietals, vintages even, in blind tastings. That was really what flipped my hair back. And then I also, I knew that if I was certified as a SOM and became a SOM at, at Wild Ginger, then I'd be able to be in on those supplier meetings. So I'd be able to meet other, meet winemakers and growers. And that was something I was really, really excited about. So it, I think if I wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't have gotten where I am, so I'm glad, but I don't miss it mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. um, and like when you're sitting for the test, or especially when you're waiting to sit for the test with the other, I think it's better now, probably, I mean this was, you know, 15 years ago or whatever, but not very many women, and I feel like it's it's like the, the worst part of Dead Poets Society, only not with something as academic as literature. You know, and you're, you're just, you're like, okay, like, it's something you swallow, come on. But, <sighs> yeah. So you mentioned that your, your time at, 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 uh, in South, South Seattle, you had like a working winery education. So you were getting hands-on experience. For sure, yeah. I'm curious about from that to your first step of first harvest at Bob <laughs> What was the learning curve for you? What did steep. you- Steep, it was steep. <laughs> Tell me about that first harvest. Uh, it, was, it was great. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it's the example that my dad set or if it's from growing up uh, partially on the island or if it's from playing competitive soccer for years I don't but some part of me really likes to be like slammed up against it and with a small crew for an Oregon harvest that's exactly what you get you get slammed up against it and so it's really long hours and be really tired and stung by yellow jackets and earwigs fall out of your clothes when you go to the bathroom and like you're wet all the time and but I just loved it. I loved it. It was, I loved all of it. I like the challenge, the like, you know, you have to stay focused and stay sharp even though you're on a 14 hour day or a 16 hour day and, and you, you know, you have to make sure you're not making a mistake when you barely know what you're doing. Um, you know, everything's on a, not on a huge scale that at Belpont. I mean, there are only about five, 6,000 cases annual production, but it's definitely a much larger scale than a teaching winery. Mm -hmm. And, and there's, you know, a teaching winery is a teaching winery, right? So if you really screw something up, it's fine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not, that, not that way at, a, at a, you know, a small winery where like every drop really counts. And so, um, so it, it was a, <laughs> I remember, <laughs> um, <laughs> So Brian w was not big into like caustic or any of those crazy chemicals, um, heavy bases, and but he so he'd use really really hot water. So uh, a hot pressure washer was what we would use for sanitizing things. I mean we, we would use sulfur spray and everything like that. But I remember being tasked with cleaning the lines, like prepping the lines before we started bringing in fruit, and. And <laughs> so I had, I had connected, I had figured out, you know, tri clover clamps, and I, I, I'd used those before. And so I had, like, so in, in the teaching winery, we would just soak things in, in chemicals, right? Um, but, but, you know, he's, he's got a, a more naturalistic approach, which is still very effective. Um, and so 
I had all the, the hoses all connected to each other so that I could clean them all at once. And you know, I set the hot seat to like nice and hot. And then I, you know, I have the the hot seat hose and I have the hoses. And the hot seat hose has a quick disconnect end, you know. And I'm like, okay. So I just kind of like put them in there. <laughs> and I turned it on. <laughs> I'm like, it doesn't seem like it's. Maybe I have to spin them. <laughs> <laughs> Brian comes and he's just like, oh, you didn't find the fitting, huh? I'm like, the fitting? <laughs> yeah, so that was, that, it was things like that, right? It, um, it was my first time using, you know, I, I had to get forklift certified and then I had to use the forklift and it was an electric forklift and um, so it's a little three-wheel guy and they're kind of squirrely. And then we had electric pallet jacks and those are also pretty squirrely. And um, then just, you know, the equipment was just on a larger scale. Um, and there was a lot, you know, he'd been doing it for a long time by then, of course. And so there was a lot of implementation of practices that he had developed through experience over the years before I got there mm -hmm. that were not necessarily there wasn't necessarily like a, a, an empirical reason. Um, and so it was a little confusing sometimes, like why am I doing this? Um, which I, you know, over time I figured it out, but uh, it was also, it was my first experience doing like lab analysis quickly, you know, cause we need to analyze all of these things by the end of the day. And so, you know, how can I set myself up on a little lab bench with a pH meter that likes to decalibrate itself randomly because it's a jerk and like doing AO aspiration oxidation for sulfites um, on the previous vintage because that also had to happen and and um, figuring out you know like I'd done all of these analyses before but it was like you know I have two samples and I have all day so it's very different with like 35 samples and two hours um, so I learned a lot about time management that I hadn't, I, you, they don't, and in the, since then, I mean, I've, I've hired Davis grads and like, it, it doesn't seem to matter what school you come out of, they don't teach you that. They don't teach you like how to bust a move, but still do it right. So, um, so it, that, was, that was one of the steep parts of the learning curve was like, we need to make sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, but we need to be very efficient. Mm -hmm. So you have to multitask because there's not enough bodies to do all the things. Mm -hmm. You know, at, in school, like we had one person for each thing and then you, you move to the next station and then you do that thing and then you move to the next station and then you do that thing and like everything was so small and controlled and so, yes, I knew the chemistry and um, I understood yeast metabolism and I understood acetobacter and I, like, I, the academic side of it, it was important to know that stuff because it definitely helped me understand why we were doing certain protocols, but, um, but it didn't help me learn how to be efficient. That one I had to learn on my feet. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I also actually, I really, once I became the assistant winemaker there and then the following harvest where I'm the one, you know, running the crew, I really had to learn how to manage people in a stressful environment um, where everybody's tired and overworked, but they're choosing to be there and everybody wants something different out of the experience. And so there's this very like delicate balance to properly managing people and I really don't think I got it I got very good at it until I'd been at Omero for a couple of years like I did pretty well at Willa Kenzie but again it was controlled you know um, but if, actually one of my friends who was working for me, I had, I had met him originally, he came to work at Willa Kenzie when I was the assistant winemaker there, and then we became really good friends, and so he would come back and work for me. And so he came to work for me at Omero, and it, it was stressful, it was my first year, and I was, 
you know, this was my baby, right? And so um, he finally, like mid-harvest, pulled me aside because he's that kind of a friend. I wish more people had friends like that. He's like, you need to calm the fuck down. Like, you're stressing people out. You can't expect everyone to be as emotionally invested in this as you are. We still want to do a good job. We want this to be a successful vintage, but you can't rip into people like that. <sighs> and, you know, it was hard to hear, of course, but, it, but I, I, I was like, oh, shit, okay. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. And that, that was a really formative moment for me as a, as a manager of people, and just in general, like, how, how to how to be professional, or what I think is professional, which is, which is respectful, and, but also pragmatic, and direct, but, but compassionate and respectful, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's a challenge, and it, things just get so stressful at Harvest, even, in a, even like a year like 2018, where everything is just sugar and rainbows, it's still stressful, mm -hmm. and, and you can't expect everyone to be as emotionally invested as you are. Um, it's different when it's your label. It's different when it's your name on it, right? Definitely, definitely. And it's also just, you know, everybody does what they do for different reasons. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you want, you want everyone to get a good experience out of it. You want people to not just improve their resume, but improve their knowledge base and their comfort level. And, you know, so you, it's, you want to benefit the people that are working for you, but you also want to make the best wine you can make. And, um, and it took me a long time, I think, to figure that out, but I, I feel good about it now. Mm -hmm. um, and, It took me, you know, Bel Belpont was just it was such a great experience. That vineyard is amazing. I mean, and Brian's just so brilliant and he's so soft-spoken and um, I, he kind of just like throws you to the wolves and lets you figure it out. And then, you know, he'll intervene if he has to. Like if, if you're really fucking something up, he won't let you fuck things up. But like, but pretty much you, you know, he's not the type to like, give you the, this like long SOP, here's how we, you know, it's, he'll just kind of give you a few tips and then be gone. And, and so it was like trial by fire. And um, I, you know, I made some mistakes. I, um, I made some mistakes just from being tired. Uh, I made some mistakes because I didn't know how to do it. Um, so one of the things that, that I learned there was how to get a hold of other people in the industry and how to how to ask them for help respectfully and like Anthony King at Lemelson saved my ass like three or four times because <laughs> they're just down the street right mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I'd like find the number and I, I'd be like hi um, this is Sarah I'm the assistant at Belpont and um, I really, my plate and frame, I don't know if I put my plates in backwards, but Brian's on a sales trip in New York and he would come over and he'd be like, oh, yep, yeah, yeah, these are the EKs. You gotta put them in like this. This side has to face this way. And I'd be like, oh my God. <laughs> so, but I, it, it taught me humility, you know, which is sort of the opposite of what you learn as a psalm. And just cooperation and humility and that there are, many priorities above your appearance, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how you appear. Um, and, and that it really, it really sunk in, you know, it's another thing that doesn't really sink in in school. I mean, it's, you know it, but it doesn't sink in until you're actually doing it, that you just get one chance every year. It's not like beer or spirits. You get one chance. Mm -hmm. So if you fuck something up, that thing is fucked. And like, that's that. And it's, I remember Robert Britton said to me one time, um, he, like we were sitting at the studio back when he made Britton there at the studio and we were sitting on the back, the tailgate of his truck waiting for my fruit to show up. And, it, and we were just bullshitting and, and he, you know, obviously fangirl because he's Robert Britton. Um, 
<laughs> and, and he was like, well, you know, I don't remember what I asked him, but he was like, well, you know, how many vintages does any winemaker have in their life? And I was like, <gasps> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, oh no, no, it's okay, calm down. <laughs> it's like, oh, we can never make any more mistakes. Um, yeah, it's, there's nothing like, there's nothing like the experience of doing it. Mm -hmm. It's nothing that they, like, I've never been around a program, a, an academic program that teaches you how to do that. And I've fired Davis grads for telling me that they're not a janitor. I'm like, uh, what? Because I wanted her to squeegee the floor after, you know, we cleaned up and I'm, I'm not a janitor. And I was like, okay, bye. <laughs> like, get the fuck out of here. We're all janitors. What, what do you think winemaking is? I mean, you know, <laughs> come on. Like, it, it, there's no, I, it's funny because I had this idea as a psalm, I had this idea of winemakers that was very glamorous and it's just not that way at all. It's very sticky and frustrating and um, I mean there's it's like the, the absolute opposite of what I thought winemaking was when I'm like behind a tank like this trying to jam the quick disconnect glycol fitting on and it's like this big around and I have little t-rex hands and I just can't get it on the thing and it's sticky and I'm like I'm like yelling behind a tank and like slipping on the gooey it's you know that's what it's actually like and um, <laughs> and there's just I don't think there's any way that a school can teach you that. Yeah. So you mentioned your, your next step after 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 Belfont was to go to New Zealand, and, and, and I admit you, you kind of and you kind of said this because what people do, and it has become much more. That's what people do. They they go to New Zealand, they go to Australia, they go. So yeah. tell me why you chose there. You mentioned they had a connection there, and, and what was different? What was different about New Zealand? Well, there's a bunch of Kiwis there, <laughs> and they're really different than Americans. You think they're not, but they are. Um, they're way cooler. And they just keep their heads, sometimes to, the, to almost to a fault, but they have, like, there's this phrase, she'll be right. I won't make a New Zealand accent, because that would be awful, but they, they say, you know, like, I remember being told, like, I had been given a work order to make a tartaric acid addition to a tank. And then, um, I don't remember how he figured, if, if I brought it to his attention or if he figured it out just going through his papers or something, but I, the way that we would make, the way I was instructed to make a tartaric acid addition, these are like four or five ton open top stainless fermenters, was to just sprinkle it over the cap and then we'd punch it in with the, with the punch down tool. And he realized that it was not the right tank. And so it's all there on top of the cap at this point. And so he's like, oh, it should be right. Just scrape it off. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. I don't know if I can scrape all of it. He's like, no, it's all right. Scrape what you can. I'm just like, oh my God, holy shit. I'm like, what? And I was like, okay. And so it was actually, it was cool because it's stressful there too. It's just like any other harvest, long days, mm -hmm. you get tired, you get hungry, but they just wouldn't, like everything was going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And everything was. And that was really helpful for me because as a perfectionist, I don't know if I would have figured that out as quickly mm -hmm. otherwise. Like I really was of the opinion before that experience that everything might not be okay when in fact everything will be okay. Um, it was also, it's different there because they don't have migrant farm workers like we have here, so we pick. And that was new. Um, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard not to cut your fingers off. And it's backbreaking. I mean, it's tough work. Um, and and there, the fruiting zone is higher there generally. Uh, but so, yeah, that was different. Um, but honestly, I, it was such a pleasure because I was an intern, and I had been an assistant winemaker. And so suddenly, all I had to do was get handed a work order and go do it. I didn't have to think. 
I mean, of course I'm aware of what I'm doing and I'm making in like, you know, if something seems weird, I'm gonna say something, but there it's, you know, you, you still have like professional accountability, but it's not the same as being responsible for this, like, so it was very relaxing. I could just like be an intern and like bust my ass and, um, and that was cool. I definitely learned that parasitic acid will destroy your Carhartt jacket. But, um, <laughs> they're, yeah, man, they're, they're kind of more cowboyish, I feel like, but the fruit is gorgeous. The Riesling in Central Otago, you know, it's high desert there. And so very aromatic fruit, very, you know, Pinot too, very dark and very aromatic, really gorgeous acid. Um, they tended to pick a little, I don't know if this was just Matt and, his program, but I kind of got the impression when we went to visit some of the other programs that they were all kind of on the same boat where, you know, they pick a little earlier than, um, I wouldn't say than Oregonians, but definitely earlier than Californians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wasn't seeing 25 bricks on things. Well, maybe on Syrah, but not on Pinot. And our Syrah came down from Hawks Bay anyway, so. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had my first experience when I was in New Zealand I mean, I had been to, to Brickhouse and, and, and like Christom and stuff before that, but I hadn't, we went to Felton Road and while the other couple of interns were at the winery, I was, I, I was really interested in the vineyard because it was very beautiful. Um, and they, 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 they're biodynamic and they, have, they had that, um, every 10th row they had it planted with all the flowers to invite beneficial insects and it was just very breathtaking and their vineyard manager was um, a very special human being just like loved it and was brilliant had been doing it for years and was a kiwi and so still had that kind of should be right you know but like but he got really he was really passionate about it and um, and so I went and hung out in the vineyard with him and that was really like that was when I realized, I had started to figure it out at Belpont, um, but that experience at Felton Road was when I realized that the magic is really the farming. And what we're doing in the winery is actually significantly less important when it comes to wine quality. I mean, it's more like, in the vineyard is where the, where the, big, most important decisions happen, whereas the winery, it, it's my, and still to this day, honestly, my winemaking philosophy basically is don't fuck it up. Get really good fruit and just don't fuck it up. Just get it fermented clean, you know, keep all the yeasties happy and do the thing and keep everything sanitized and it'll, it'll do the rest. Um, so while it didn't, I never really got deeply into biodynamics, um, partly because like, I feel like it really depends on your approach. Some people are overly dogmatic about it. Gareth at, at Felton Road was not dogmatic about it. He, he ha it all made sense. It all jived with that vineyard. It was, it was more of a sustainability practice than anything else. And then the, the preps that he, everything was grown there. And so it all sort of, it was really sustainable. They had the cows and they had all of the various herbs. And so, and they had a little shed where they would prepare all the teas. And so it was really simple and it made a lot of sense that way. Um, and I guess that's not necessarily really different from here, but the tension level in general there was just way lower. Like, Americans are kind of psycho, I think. <laughs> I actually think that more today than I did then. Say, so you came back. I did, I know I did. It's because it's actually, I would have I moved there and done it there, but um, it's, it's the fruit here. Mm -hmm. It's the flavors here. It's just, it's exactly how I like Pinot, is how it happens here. I mean, I, I, lo you know, I love standing out at Hirsch Vineyard and being like, oh my God, there's the ocean, oh, you know, but like, and, and like Kelowna, British Columbia is gorgeous.
gorgeous and Canadians are so nice and like healthcare. <laughs> but the fruit here, mm -hmm. just it's very specific. Mm -hmm. um, I've very rarely been fooled in the last few years in blind tastings if there's an Oregon in there and it's all Pinot and it's many regions. Like I just, I know my region and I, because I love it. Um, so I knew I would come back here. Um, and I mean, I've spent a little time, not harvest time, but off season time in France and in California. I haven't spent time up in the Okanagan. That would be a good time. I would like to do that at some point, but and also Tassie, I'd like to spend some time there. But, um, but no, I just, it's, this is what's up mm -hmm. for Pinot, for me, mm -hmm. it's here. Plus the Rieslings, we can grow some good Riesling here. So you mentioned that at your, at, your, at the kind of education level that you were working with Washington fruit, so not, not, not Pinot Noir yet. So between Belpont and New Zealand and then back in Willow Kinsey. Tell me about learning to work with, with Pinot and, and what was different about it than what you had previously experienced working with grapes. It's a giant asshole. It's such a pain in the ass. It's such a pain. The skins are so thin and like the clusters are so tight and it rains here a lot. Less lately, but back in those years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like just mold pressure, disease pressure, bird pressure, insect pressure, you know, late spray pressure. I mean, fuck. And, and it's, and like you can take a cluster of, of Washington Syrah and like you can drop kick it against a wall and it'll make pretty wine. Mm -hmm. Honestly, like it's so sturdy. The clusters are big and loose. The berries are thick skinned and like it doesn't like with Cab or Merlot, Merlot a little bit actually has, the, has some commonalities with Pinot in fermentation kinetics, but, but like Cab and Syrah or like Malbec, they don't make that cap that Pinot makes in fermentation where it's just like this layer of concrete. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to contend with making sure that the CO2 gets out and that enough air gets in. Whereas with Pinot, it like, you know, like it really makes this tight cap. And, and then if it gets too hot, it gets stressed and sulfur like off odors. Or if you don't break the cap soon enough, it gets stressed and sulfur like off odors. Or if you don't feed it when it wants to be fed, it gets stressed and sulfur like off odors. Or if it starts, you know, if you cold soak and then you don't get the temperature different change to your warm fermentation temperature quickly enough, you've got VA for days. Mm -hmm. And ethyl acetate. Pinot loves to go ethyl acetate. Uh, it loves to get reductive. And there are enough winemakers around this valley or there were then at least and we're kind of into the like new guard winemakers these days here for the most part so there's less of this but you know there were those winemakers who, who would tell seriously they would tell customers oh that's pinot funk no that's hydrogen sulfide you idiot um <laughs> and it's just they're so like and it when P pinot will turn so fast Syrah for like from Washington, like all the Washington fruit from Eastern Washington comes in with like yams of like four. It's just garbage nutrients, nothing. Mm -hmm. But it, in a way it, that sort of makes it easier because you know that. So you're like, okay, I have to rehydrate the yeast with a nutrient or, you know, if I'm going spontaneous, I need to make sure there's enough complex nutrients in there that whatever spontaneous yeast, you know, situation is gonna have a healthy fermentation, it's gonna get dry. And if you have, if your Syrah like gets a little, sulfide mid-ferment, you pretty much just need to pump it over for 10 minutes, it'll be fine. Pinot, like, if you catch it in the first hour that it's reductive, you can pump it over for 10 minutes and it'll be fine. But if you missed it and it's been six hours or more, you can get fucked. You're coppering your fermenter and you're pissed off about it and you still have 10 more bricks to go. It's, um, yeah, I, I had no idea what I was getting myself into, honestly. It, my first vintage was 2007. 
And I was like, are you fucking serious right now? <laughs> We're, I was, I mean, I had a, I had a little like a kitchen strainer, like a mesh, wire mesh strainer. And one of my, the things that I would do first thing in the morning was I would go from fermenter to fermenter and I would scrape the fuzzy mold with my wire mesh strainer off the corners, the white fur. Um, you know, the, we didn't really sort in school and because you don't need to with Washington fruit. You just don't. You might, need, you might be destemming, but you don't need to sort. And you had to sort in 2007. You had to sort. And you're not just sorting out botrytis, you're sorting out green. Um, you know, if, if, you're, if part of your thinning program in the vineyard is, does not include cutting wings, depending on your clone, you, you have a wing and it's got a little couple green berries on it and like, you're already, it's 2007, so you're already like crossing your fingers hoping for 22 bricks. So like you can't have green berries in there and uh, then, you know, you've got the seed tannin issue and like, and then, um, just, yeah, it, then one of the first couple times I started punching down very active ferments and like you're on your board on top of the fermenter and you're like, Sunk. like, no, <clears throat> fuck. And that's, and then, then I figured out that's why the punch down tool had the, the bar that you hold in the bar below because you need your foot to get through. And these are just macro bins, it's a ton and a half. But the cap, the other varietals don't do that. And then it also, other varietals, you know, Merlot, Syrah, Cab, they turn black right away. Pinot's like pink for like the first eight to 10 bricks. And you're like, oh my God, what did I do wrong? You know, like, or if you're, even if you're cold soaking, like dry ice helps. But, you know, then there's that whole other, like, okay, I'm cold soaking, I, I get, got all of the extractable anthocyanins, well, there's still acetaldehyde present, but when you extract one thing, you extract other things, and so now I'm phenolic on the finish, and now I have to deal with that. And, like, how am I going to deal with that? Okay, you know, I don't necessarily have fresh Chardonnay leaves to add, so what am I going to add instead? And it, you know, peanut, oh, peanut. <laughs> I love making Pinot Rosé because it's just so much easier. Juice is so much easier than skins. Um, the thing with Pinot though is like, like Syrah and Cab ferments generally, in my experience, would, you know, midway through they'd just start to feel like, smell like fermentation, which is a nice smell. But if you have a Pinot ferment that's like, like you nailed it, like it's healthy, and you're at or below, say, 82 degrees Fahrenheit, it can smell phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Like you wanna just like dab it behind your ears. It's so <laughs> amazing. And so it's that same, oh, and I remember, fuck, I remember at Willa Kenzie, um, uh, it was uh, it was it was Aliette. It was Aliette, and it, this was like the pomard, the like Thibaut's favorite, and we were fermenting in nine ton open tops, and um, we had to we we had solenoid valves, but you had to manually open them for the or change them to hot from cold and stuff, and so we had inoculated the tank, but um, we'd forgotten. I had forgotten to to turn the heat on. And we, we inoculated, of course we inoculated with RC212 because what is a more temperamental yeast than that? Zero to yeast is more temperamental than RC212. So let's put it into our moderate nutrient level Pinot and forget to turn the heat on. Awesome. So it got stinky. Aliette cannot be stinky. So I, I had to stand there with a hot water hose, turn the heat on, but stand there with a hot water hose on the jacket for two hours. I sent the interns home. I'm just. Yeah, you know. But it's rewarding, though, you know, after like. Oh, and then I learned, I also learned during, uh, at, at, 
Omero, when I start, you know, I can buy all the barrels I want, like all the ones I actually want, right? And so, you know, I got a little barrel happy. And that's when I discovered that there are reasons why people don't make 100% new oak pinots, because it's gross. And so, you know, it's, there's just, it's, it's so much more susceptible to oxidization as a varietal because it's only got about 30% of the phenolic content that like a Cab or a Syrah has. And so, you know, tannins are antioxidants. And so you have that to deal with. You have, you know, depending on your site here, mm -hmm. pHs can be on the high side but you don't have that tannin to kind of balance it out. So then it's like, you know, where, when is actually the right time to harvest to, you know, whereas like, it's like with Cab or Syrah, you know, there's, there's a little gray area, but then it's like anywhere from, you know, 24 to 26 bricks, you're fine. Mm -hmm. And usually the places where those grow, you can just like do it when you feel like it because it's not gonna start raining torrentially for the next two weeks, mm -hmm. the day after tomorrow. Whereas here, it's like you usually have maybe a 15 to 20 day window to get everything off. And at Willa Kenzie, I started to feel that sense more, but they had that cold storage, that big cold storage facility, and they picked into those little cutie short guys with the slats. And so it was still less pressure there. It's actually here where that time frame really hurts. Mm -hmm because you know, I need to get 1,500 tons in, and it's all from right here. Mm -hmm. So it all wants to come in at the same time, and like I can, I fi we physically cannot bring it all in at the same time. It's impossible. I gotta turn tanks. You know, I don't have enough tanks for everything at the same time. So then it's like, okay, how can I make, well, that's a whole, that's a whole now thing, but yeah. And we're, and we're close to that, but I'm, I'm curious first about you. You, you mentioned Omero as kind of your first, the first, the first of yours, the first, the first, yeah. the first, the first kid, you know, yeah. and, and you were, and, and tell me about its evolution and what, what, and then and what the step was from there to here. Um, okay. So, yeah, so it evolved from that first ton that, that I, we bought from Harry Peterson Edry and then planted the vineyard and then, you know, started making it at the studio. Um, and that vineyard there on Ribbon Ridge, I mean, it's a great vineyard. Like, I assume it is still a great vineyard. Um, it's a beautiful site. It's some north, some west facing. It's some south facing a little bit. And, um, it's, you know, that Willa Kenzie soil series and there's a lot of, we had a lot of uh, groundwater. We ended up having to like, we had some vines um, lost to erosion. And so we had to go back in and do more drainage tiles and stuff. But it was really fun to work with results partners. They're very professional. And, um, and it was Daniel Fay actually, who had come from Willa Kenzie, who before, before I was there, who was the one overseeing that development. And so he's a brilliant guy and really, um, very pragmatic, which is kind of few and far between in this industry. And so when you do encounter someone who's pragmatic, you're like, yay. <laughs> People get really emotional here. Um, so, you know, I think developing the, so the name, Omero, we were trying to figure out a name for the longest time and it was actually an anagram of the family's last name, Moore, mm -hmm. which was my last name at the time. But we, we were only married, actually married for a year or so. Um, so we came up with a name. We came up with that original label that's kind of, it's very different from the label I've seen more recently. Um, but it's, you know, it's kind of scripty and white with a little branch, um, deboss and or emboss. Um, and so then the first two Pinots were the Odyssey and the Iliad because Omero is how you say Homer in Italian. Um, and then they, I think we ended up having to change those because of copyright shit, but it was, uh, the development of the wines went really well. Um, I think, you know, 
It was really helpful to be the assistant winemaker somewhere else while doing this small production because, you know, I could kind of pick these guys' brains if something was going weird for me. And um, so by the time we were big enough to be at the Carlton Winemaker Studio, I had a pretty solid foundation of running a crew and when you make certain decisions and why you make those decisions and what the outcome of many of those decisions would be and like, what's the most efficient way to do certain things. Um, it was when that was how I figured out, how I started to develop um, my ability to build and maintain grower relationships, uh, which is, can be very delicate here, you know, because it's pretty much the only agricultural product where you cut fruit and put it on the floor on purpose. And farmers don't like doing that very much. <laughs> So, you know, how to negotiate that in a way where everyone, you know, at the end of the negotiation, everyone feels satisfied, mm -hmm. very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, then I had to deal with, one year we had to deal with a, a spray drift from a Christmas tree farm that just demolished, like, about an acre of our vines. And um, it was a vineyard we were leasing, but, it was my favorite vineyard. It was Bass Hill, McMinnville ABA. I still miss that vineyard. <laughs> um, so by the time, let's see, so I left there in 2014, like January. And then I started with Precept in, I was hired in May, started June 1st. So when I left, um, so we'd gotten divorced and, but they had still, they had decided, the family had decided they still wanted me to make the wines. And so I kept doing that, but then my ex-husband got remarried and, um, that precipitated a change of heart. Just leave it at that. Um, <laughs> so I left. Uh, I was surprised to go, and um, and but but go I did. And so then I had to figure out, you know, what I was going to do next. And that those months were definitely some of the hardest of my life. And actually, those months were the beginning of what ended up resulting in me not drinking. Um, so I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, right? And you know, I've got a great resume, but like it's scarce here in Oregon, like for a, a lead winemaking job or even a, a really good assistant job. They don't come up very often. And um, you know, I interviewed for the one that did come up during that time, and I, I really didn't want to work there. But I wanted to stay in Oregon. I, I like, I would have, if that had been the only option, I, pr I probably would have done it. But I, I'm really glad I didn't end up there. They sold anyway to another company. But, um, but I, I had to start entertaining the possibility of leaving Oregon, mm -hmm. and that was very difficult, but I wasn't willing to go to stop the progress and like go work in a restaurant or something. So, so rather than make adjustments to what I was doing in order to stay in Oregon, it was more important to me to keep making wine and keep being, you know, a lead winemaker. Cause that's, you can't go back after, you know, you like, I mean, you could go be a vintage winemaker somewhere and like hang out and have fun and help somebody, but once you've run the show, you want to keep running the show. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I ended up um, in uh, San Inez, um, in right by f at this vineyard right near uh, Foxen, and um, they'd flown me down to talk about what we would do to update the winery 
the winery needed a lot of updating, but they had a lot of money. And they had a big, beautiful vineyard, a lot of Pinot, Zin, which I'd never even, and, and then some fun Italian varietals. They had a little Carmenere, which was very exciting. Um, and then kind of your standard collection of whites. Mm -hmm. And they had a guest house and it was a pretty sweet deal. It was kind of out in the middle of nowhere, but it's beautiful. That, that funny mountain range that runs you know, east-west. Um, so the weather patterns are really different. That was cool. But so I'm, I'm on this trip down there, and, and uh, I, think I, I don't think I was with the, the owners, the couple, at the time that I received this. So I had applied for, for the job with Precept. I didn't know who they were. I, I, think I, had, I think I had put together that, that 12th and Maple, and so I already knew, that's right, I forgot. So with Omero Cellars, we made the, uh, the 2011 vintage here. Mm -hmm. I forgot about that vintage. So, <laughs> so I already knew this place, and that was a, we had a, I had a really positive experience here. I worked with Michael Collier, and he's amazing, and um, the crew is amazing, and they're very clean, and they're very responsive, and so the wines were great, and it was a great experience, and it was 2011, so it could have been a lot worse. Um, so I, I, I didn't know if like Precept owned Twelfth and Maple or, and I, I wasn't, oh, I didn't quite grasp like, all I knew was that it was, it was a job that was in Dundee and so I could stay in Oregon and it sounded like there'd be a bit of autonomy, which was what I wanted. And there really weren't any other gigs like that available, not for months, right? And so I had applied for that. I'd gone to Washington to interview at Canoe Ridge for this, for this job. And I brought some of my Omero wines. And they had some samples of uh, their Oregon wines um, and that I could taste and give feedback on. And I think I had I'd been, I'd been searching for so long at that, you know, well, so long, for three months at that point that I felt very desperate, but also I felt very, like, unabashed, like I'd kind of lost my polish, and so I, when I was evaluating their wines, I was just like, are you fucking serious, man? Who decided to pick this? Like, I, I really shredded their wines, and um, <laughs> it was pretty funny. So... We still laugh about it. <laughs> it's one pack to take in an interview. Yeah, um, I didn't. I mean, I didn't. I don't know. It. I was just. I was kind of at wit's end at that point. But so, you know, I was waiting to hear back. I knew they had other interviews. I. I kind of knew who the other person. It was kind of between us, and I thought that that other person was more qualified than I, um, on paper at least. And so I was down in California, and then I'm on that vineyard in San Ynez, and I, I get this call from um, from Precept and, and and they offered me the job and I, I, I didn't even ask the salary. I was like, yep. <laughs> I'm standing on this gorgeous vineyard in California. I'm like, yep. When, when? When can I start? And he's like, do you want to know how much? I'm like, uh, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's how I felt about it. Like, I didn't care. Mm -hmm. I didn't care, um, and and so then then I then I came. I mean, I I thanked that couple, and I flew back. And uh, before I basically I waited till I got home because it it was awkward for me to I now I think I would have had you know the nuts to tell them there, but I, at the time I didn't, and I was still kind of hedging my bets maybe a little bit, so I waited a couple of days after I got back before I called them, and I was like, hey, I, you know, I found a local job, I'm going to take it. But uh, then they basically like arranged for me to meet Tom, one of the winemakers here, and gave me a password for the database here. 
And that was about it. Mm -hmm. And they were in Seattle. They're like, call us if you need anything, bye. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So I sit down with Tom, I'm like, so, he's like, <laughs> like his background is from like big wineries in California, Bronco, right? And, and I'm coming from like super boutique-y, very expensive, everything's been gone over with a fine tooth comb, you know? And so I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm trying to figure out, you know, so how many, how many tons am I supposed to be doing? He's like, well, you know, last year you did about, well, we, your brand did about 800. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> and so, but then as it turned out, I was supposed to do about 1,000 and like, I couldn't even wrap my head around that number. Um, so then I had to go like, see the vineyards and then meet the vineyard partners, you know, cause there's, this family, like this facility and my company and the Oregon vineyards that are affiliated with this facility, at the end of the day, it all does come down from the same top of the pyramid, but we are separate companies. And so that was confusing for me for a long time. It took like two years to figure that whole thing out. Um, Cause like they have this, Precept has the sales people out there selling the wine saying, we own, we're the largest private owner of planted vineyard acres in the state of Oregon, which Technically is not true, but it sort of is. Anyway, so um, so I get to know the vineyards, and then you know I like a couple of them are really dope. They're all actually really nice, but there are a couple that are like super exciting vineyards. And and, and so I'm like, okay, so let's see the sorting line, and and he, and they're like, huh, okay. <laughs> it's like you you have access to 22 ton open tops that you can and so you can bring in enough tons to turn those 1.5 times and those tons you can have hand picked and sorted and everything else is coming in by machine and it goes in the pit and you're fermenting in seven and six thousand gallon closed top fermenters and I'm just like what how do I punch you don't punch anything it's pulse air I'm like pulse what <laughs> Like there, it was, we were part way through harvest of 2014 <laughs> when I finally went down to the cellar floor and like approached a cellar hand and was like, hi, can you show me what the pulse air machine is? And he's like, aren't you the winemaker for Precept? And I'm like, mm-hmm. And he's like, oh, okay, it's over here. <laughs> I'd been writing work orders for it. I was like, I don't know what the fuck I was doing. So, um, so that was different. The, it was a very steep learning curve here the first year. And like, I think I probably drove Tom completely bananas because I had this boutique ethos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I burst into tears when my first load of machine harvested fruit came. Tom says, hey, your fruit's here. Come on down. And so I walked down to the pit and the truck pulls up and they hook the D-ring onto the eight ton tub on the back and they tip the tub. And I'm like, and it's whoosh, you know, it's all destemmed, obviously machine harvested fruit into the pit. And, and I started crying. Tom, he loves telling that story because he was just like, <laughs> 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 I was like, Is that, that's really, that's mine? <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> uh, so, one of the things that they needed, because they were coming off of, so Precept was coming off of the 2011 Oregon vintage that had just been awful for them. It was very light in color. And so like all of their distributors on the East Coast, their wholesalers were like, and they were really trying to hang on to those relationships. Mm -hmm. So they were like, okay, we actually need to have an applied winemaker here because what they had been doing was just um, just a you know grape to bottle custom crush deal with these guys so the wines were always very clean mm -hmm. and you know made properly mm -hmm. but it was the harvesting decisions that were really where it kind of fell short mm -hmm. because the harvesting decisions were basically made by when these guys logistically wanted to receive fruit and when the vineyard guys wanted to pick the rest of that vineyard because the machines are there today kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with a vintage like 2011, if you pick early, you're super fucked. And so um, 
They did. They picked early. And so the wines were just underripe. Mm -hmm. They were just green. Mm -hmm. And so the biggest emphasis for me was color. And so, I mean, at least I knew enough. I was like, okay, well, can I make rosé? Can you sell rosé? And they're like, okay. well, first I was, I'd come from Willa Kenzie, right? So I'm like, I mean, it had been a few years ago, but I'm like, okay, do you have a concentrator? And they're like, no. I was like, oh, shit. Can I make rosé? And they're like, sure. Cool. And so we just would bleed every tank. And so color's never been an issue. But then I, like, then the rosé program took off. And so now I, like, never have enough rosé and I have to buy bulk. But... <laughs> Um, so yeah, so the first year, the first two years were exciting, but incredibly stressful. Um, I ended up working in 2014, I ended up working like three, not at this, not in a row, but over the course of the harvest, three different 24s. Cause I just couldn't stop mm -hmm. cause they run 24 hours during harvest. You know, and I was reacting to every vineyard, right? Like I didn't, I had built some basic SOPs, but I needed to understand what I was dealing with. So I couldn't really write a full thorough SOP winemaking protocol. And so I was reacting to what was happening. And so I'd have to taste and I'd have to look and I'd have to go through, you know, if when you only have six or seven days that you can be on skins, cause then you have to turn the tank. You, you can't be dogmatic, you mm -hmm. can't. Mm -hmm. You can't be a natural winemaker. Like you have to know what, you have to know what tools to use and how to use them and when. And if you know that, you don't like, it's not, you don't have to like dump a bunch of shit at it, but you, you do have to dump a little bit of shit at it and you have to dump it at the right time. Mm -hmm. And so every tank was a trial because I needed to figure out what I liked and what was gonna work the best and it was, it was like, when I thought Belpont was trial by fire, that was child's play. I had no support, I had no training from like the here's how we do things. It was on the, you know, I would piss Tom off and that's how I'd get trained, basically. He's like, we can't fucking do that. And I'd be like, oh, okay. Can we do this? No. Can we do this? Yes. Okay. Okay. Adjust, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I wanted to delastage all the tanks and do seed removal. I'm sure you can imagine how hilarious they thought that was. They agreed to do one, just to, just, you know, to like, cause I was new and they were being nice. And um, yeah, so, and I wanted to pump over and they're like, nope, that's not in your contract. And I'm like, well, fuck yeah. Okay, okay, can I do my own yeast inoculations? Nope, that's a liability. This is custom crush, you're a client. So all I, all I can really do, is pull samples, but I can't add things. Um, we found we found some common ground there when it comes to the ultra premium, the little tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, they let me go in them, um, which is kind of how I inoculate everything. I go in one that's fermenting, then I go in all the other ones. But mm. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean I really still I can't I can't like prepare my own yeast or anything like that. So. That I was like bumping up against that a lot. I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated about machine harvested fruit. I'm frustrated about closed top fermenters. I'm frustrated about pulse air. I don't understand it. I'm frustrated that I can't have pump overs. I'm frustrated that I can't add things myself. I'm, I'm micromanaging, but I'm not really allowed to micromanage, but like I'm stressing out about how the lab is preparing the yeast. I'm, I don't know if they're acclimatizing properly and I'm stressing out about like knowing when a work order is completed and it like, I'm trying to just keep up with the fruit, you know, and make sure I'm harvesting at the right time. And I was getting strong armed by the vineyard managers because they'll do that until you stop them. And it's not, it's not malicious, it's just they're busy and they want things to go smooth. And so they're like, well, the machines aren't gonna be there that day, so. And it was hard for me at first. You know, now I'm like, fuck you, yes, they will be. And they will be. But like, and I, I mean, we have a great relationship now, so it's not, it's not conflict. But at the time, I'm, you know, and then, and then there was the whole, oh my God. So, you know, you come up in Oregon in boutique production and you're, programmed to 2.5 tons per acre. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so 
That's not how all of my vineyards are. And at the time, I mean, I was programmed for that. Like, I, I, that, that was right and anything else was wrong. So I'm, I'm like out at these vineyards in the summer, you know, in August and stuff, and I'm just, or like, you know, before Verizon, and I'm like, so, okay. So they're like, do you, you know, what do you, they actually didn't, nobody really asked me what I wanted, but I would go and I'd be like, hey, so we need a cut, we need a thin. And they're like, okay, like how much? And I'm like, well, we need to thin down to 2.5 tons per acre. And they laughed in my face. <laughs> Like, that's not going to happen. I'm like, okay, well, well, let's thin to like 26 clusters per vine. And they're like, mm, no. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> shit. Can we thin to two clusters per shoot? Okay. I'm like, cool. So for the most part, that would work out to be like four tons, which was really off-putting for me, but now, <laughs> depending on the vineyard and the block, that's actually a totally fine number. Those vines can get that ripe, and it's beautiful fruit, and you're not losing anything doing that. 2.5 tons is fucking ridiculous, and it's very site-specific. Mm -hmm. So I have certain sites where that is the right number, but I also have sites where four and a half is a good number. Um, it just really depends. So. I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm learning how to deal with growers on a whole other level. Like when you're paying what we were paying for fruit at Omero, you can say things like that. But when you have this like bulk production contract where, you know, the fruit pricing is low, mm -hmm. um, the only way that everybody wins is for crop load to be higher. And so then, you, you know, you have, like, that has to be okay to some extent. So you have to have, figure out how to make that work. Um, there have been, yeah, the first three years were just, holy shit. Fortunately, my first year fermenting, so I had to blend and bottle the 13s. And that was my first experience with adding sugar right before bottling. Like I'd, I had done some chaptalization before in, you know, to a fermenter, to must before fermentation, but I'd never added sugar to a finished wine like right before bottling. And, and yeah, I wasn't instructed to do so. I just, I had the wine, I had it, you know, it was 2013, it was kind of not that great of a vintage weather wise. And so I, I had to like, I'm, you know, I blend the wines and then I'm like, oh my God, fuck, okay. So I'm, you know, I need balance, they're green. And, you know, so when you have that varied ripeness thing, you've got, you know, beautiful acidity, but you don't necessarily have a lot of like texture and the phenolics on the back end will be kind of gritty. And so I'm, try I'm trying to like, I didn't have that deep of a toolkit coming in here because I always had amazing, miraculous, gorgeous fruit. So I didn't need that deep of a toolkit. I, I had a couple of tannins that I loved for finishing. But I didn't use them that often. I, I had a yeast rehydration nutrient that I liked. I had a couple yeasts that I liked. I had one enzyme that I liked that I would use occasionally. And it was kind of, that was pretty much it. Mm -hmm. And so, so I just, I like, one thing that they did do in Seattle was they sent me my rep for Enardis and for Lafour. And so the rep would come and with their little kit and I'd be like, okay, here's what I'm looking for. I need it to, it, here's what it's like. I need it to be more like this. And I'd be like, okay, let's try four grams per hectoliter of this tannin and eight grams per hectoliter of this polysaccharide mana protein. And then we'll do an 80 mil per hectoliter add of this gum Arabic. And have you thought about sucrose? And I'm like, Sucrose? Are we talking about the same sucrose? Like, yes, C and H. I was like, oh my God. Like, well, no, but fuck it. They were like, cause I have a 10% solution right here. And I'm like, okay. Man, a gram and a half of sugar and like, oh, so much better. I was like, whoa, this is kind of fun. And, um, and then you know, that it all kind of started, you know, oak, oak, that was the other thing, like, I mean, 
this won't this won't make it to in front of that many people. I hope. Uh, but <laughs> that was a good start. <laughs> well, like you know, barrels. I have lots of barrels. That's great. But like, I make way more wine than I have barrels for. But everybody gets oak. So that was a whole other thing. I had never, like chips, blocks, staves, you know. And I mean, honestly, I came into this thinking, like I, I poo-pooed that sort of thing. You know, that, that was, that was two buck chuck shit, man. Like, this is Oregon Pinot. You know, I mean, I was very, I was like, right, what? I have to what? That's my only way to what, you know? And, and so I had my whole, I had bag and boxes. At the time, I had a desk right where that fridge is. And I had probably 30 bag and boxes, tri oak trials with 2013 wine, because that was all I had access to at the time, um, to figure out which type of chips and how much to add. And, and like, that scared me. And then, and then it took me until, I think, now maybe I trialed it a little bit in 2014, but mox. I'm like, that's a fun word. What does that mean? You know, like, they're like, micro oxygenation. I'm like, what? What is that? Is that like pulse air? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Um, yeah. So all of it. I had wanted to work in a tank farm, like I wanted to go to Australia and do a tank farm thing, like, you know, because I heard that story that everybody likes to tell about that guy who was able to stay at that winery carrying an empty bucket back and forth for a week before anybody asked him if he worked there and he didn't work there. And so, I, you know, I wanted to try that. I wanted to see the, the five inch must lines and all that, um, do like a harvest like that. And this isn't that, but there are aspects of this that are, that are what I was thinking that would be like. Mm -hmm. And then I also, you know, some of my colleagues in the industry were a little judgy, mm -hmm. like, like it was selling out mm -hmm. to do this. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like I was selling out. And, and so I kind of came in with this chip on my shoulder, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this program. Like, we're going to fucking hand sort and we're going to, you know, I'm like, no. But it, it was, you know, I, Tom and I, like, I love him. He's seriously like an uncle now. But that first year, I would probably, yeah. <laughs> I was so, I was so truculent a lot of the time and um, stubborn and, but also ignorant. So it was like a really fun combination. Um, very similar to why certain things have happened in our country um, over the last year. So, it just, I, <laughs> I just, um, it was really hard. It was really hard the first few years. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that definitely is why come, you know, 2016, f February, I, like by then, you know, getting through those two vintages and I was so busy. And then like, I can't be with the seller crew, right? Like, cause it's a, cause it's custom crush and I'm a client. So nothing will happen to the wines without a directive from me, but I can't physically do anything to the wines. And that was weird. Cause I came up, you know, I had a degree, but I came up dragging hoses with my guys. Right. And I loved that. And so that was hard for me to adjust to. And I didn't trust the lab to do my ads, you know, cause I never let anybody put yeast in anything besides myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so like all of that, I'm alone most of the time because I'm slammed, busy with like figuring out how to navigate the database and how can I organize this information so that you know everybody keeps track of the directives because the database that they use here for the work orders as a client, I have read only privileges. So I have to keep track of my work orders on my own. And, and so I'm just trying to figure out how to fucking do that. And you know what's funny is like after all this time, I'm, I'm happy and confident and I still, I do it with a fucking moleskin and multicolored Sharpies. That is my chosen organization method. Um, I do have a spreadsheet during harvest, but otherwise it's seriously, it's like green is for Monday. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, 
by the time it, you know I'd gotten through the 2015 harvest and oh my God, 2015, it was so heavy, so heavy. Like even thinning, it was heavy. It, I had we had too so much fruit. There was no way I was going to be able to get it into the tanks I had allocated for me here, and so I ended up having to send 80 tons in tub trucks up to Walla Walla to Waterbrook because I couldn't fit it here. Um, <laughs> So, I, so coming off of that vintage, and then going into the dark winter that happened between 15 and 16, and I just, um, I just kind of fell apart. Like, and I had been gradually falling apart over the course of those two years. And I mean, I loved what I did, and I, I never really dropped the ball. Prof I mean, I came close, but I never really dropped the ball professionally. But I totally dropped the ball personally. Um, and like I was empty and like all I did was work and stress about work or like sit in my dark house and like drink. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, I mean, I eventually like, I had a, I had a couple of really good friends um, who are now like ride or dies because of it that were like oh, this, you're, you're, this is not going to end well, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I got a DUI. Um, so I finally, like, I just finally had to make the decision. Because it, it just, I had gotten past the point where, like, I was so depressed and I had so much anxiety that I wasn't managing that I'd gotten past the point where I could just, like, back off and just drink a little bit sometimes. Like, it was either way too much or none. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know how to do none by myself, so I checked into a 30-day inpatient rehab facility, and this company had my fucking back. Didn't ask any questions. I got a Family Medical Leave Act leave. Mm -hmm. They held my job for me. They pushed my bottling back. And when I was done and I came out, they were like, yay, we pushed your bottling back a month. How you feeling? <laughs> Nobody asked me where I was. Nobody asked me shit. And they just, like, my, ins my health insurance through them covered it. And the HR lady, who was the one person who knew what was going on, never said shit to anybody. And, like, that, that's when I really realized that I hadn't sold out at all coming to work for this company. It's just larger production. Mm -hmm. But they're very, um, they've taken really good care of me. Mm -hmm. I get emotional. <laughs> no, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, and, and, it, and it, it was an invest, it was a risk on their part, you know, to like let that happen the way it did. And, and it, they, it was a risky investment and it fucking paid off. Mm -hmm. And they make a lot of risky investments and not all of them, but most of them pay off, which is why the company does so well. Which is why we came out of 2020 like super solid mm -hmm. because we make things in cans that are like grapefruit flavored and chocolate wine and shit like that. They don't give a fuck. They're like, let's try this. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so th that then 2016 harvest was my first harvest sober and it was the best harvest I'd ever had. Granted, it was 2016, so that helped. <laughs> because it was awesome. Talking about 2016 Harvest and, and being kind of the, the best one for you. Yeah, totally. Tell, tell, me, tell me why. I finally figured out how to functionally run a, an ongoing Harvest spreadsheet. Um, so it was a combination of being organized ahead of time and being on top of my data. Mm -hmm. It was a combination of that and by that point I had I spent the summer of 2016, like, you know, because right after I got out of treatment, I felt awkward for a while, as you can imagine. You know, I, I had to decide, like, do I need to move to Hawaii and roast coffee, or can I do this still? Like, how do I hang out with my people? Are they still my people? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. what do I do with my time now, you know? And, and so what I ended up doing was, like, throwing myself into grower relations. And so like all summer long, I'm out like getting to know my growers and I'm ha taking them to lunch and I'm bringing them beer and I'm walking the vineyards with them and negotiating farming 
techniques and like, you know, here's, here's what I saw in 2015 from the fruit and I'd bring them wine and like, here's, here's a 2014. I'm, I, you know, here's what I like about this wine. Here's what I wish was a little different. And here were the struggles and like, let's try to, you know, and, and so I spent a lot of time doing that. So I had that kind of squared away by the time, you know, it was getting close to making picking decisions for 2016. Um, I had developed the program just like the production program with our, our various SKUs for the brands that I produce um, in a more comprehensive and also kind of a more boutique sort of way. Mm -hmm. um, I'd gotten to know the seven and 6,000 gallon closed top fermenters and how to deal with those. And they're actually pretty awesome. You'd think they'd get reductive, like, but they don't, um, which, uh, I'd, I'd gotten comfortable with mocks. I'd built up my toolkit. Um, and so I understood, you know, I, the main thing that I'm always contending with because of what I've mentioned about crop loads and machine harvested fruit is, is varied ripeness. Mm -hmm. So I'm always work, I'm always, you know, preemptively thinking about how can I mitigate green flavors and tannins. Um, and so I had taken a lot of notes in 2014, 2015. Like while I was slowly losing my mind, I was really on top of what I was doing at work. So, um, so I had a lot, I just, I kind of had all my shit together. And um, and I was able, that was the first harvest where, and I, I'd also finally learned you know, during my time in treatment and that, that following summer, I had developed the ability to balance my time and make sure that I was taking care of myself mm -hmm. and like doing yoga and hanging out with my parents and eating right shit like that mm -hmm. <laughs> and that really makes a difference mm -hmm. come harvest you know I so I, I made damn sure before the harvest started that like I had my days I had my schedule put together such that I could go home at six or seven and be done mm -hmm. for the day mm -hmm. and um, and I could you know eat a good meal and hang out with my dog and like everything would be good. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that, that, and then it was also, it was also 2016 and I had weeded out some of the vineyards that were just never really going to give me the quality I was looking for and kind of dialed in that a lot better. And so, um, picking decisions in a year like 2016 are just way easier than they are in a year like 2013 or 2011. Um, or 17 even, it just, it's kind of like, oh, let's let it hang another six days, you know? I mean, it's so easy because it, it didn't rain mm -hmm. and it was, it, but it wasn't too hot. It was like, it was great. So you could just kind of whenever you want. And, um, and then some of the vineyards just were great that year. Um, the crop load was moderate even without thinning. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I got pretty fortunate in that respect, but mostly it was just that I was, I knew what I was, I knew, like I learned something every harvest. I'm never like, I'm not a master. I don't know if I'll ever be a master of this craft, but I was more confident. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wasn't second guessing every fucking decision. Um, and I could sleep. I would go home and I would eat and I would sleep. And it was night and day, mm -hmm. you know? And I think I did like 1,200 tons or something. And, you know, it was great. Like those wines have all been gone for a long time now. And they're, I mean, it was a great vintage. It, yeah, it, it was, and then, but then 2018 happened. Now I think that was my best vintage. <laughs> but 2016 was my best vintage in, in set, like, It'll always be my best in this in some ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
You talked earlier about the kind of the, the stigma of, of, a, of a winery this size in Oregon and, and how you had friends in the industry who had that stigma and it kind of, kind of manifested in you as well. Tell me about coming to terms with that and about not being able to have the personal touch with all of the wines that you, that you perhaps had before and maybe won again. Well, fortunately, I still do have that with a portion of my production. Mm -hmm. So if it weren't for that, I think it would be harder. Um, but, you know, I do, I do have the ultra premium side of my production. It's only about, so I mean, it's like 120 tons. I'm doing like 1,500. So it's less than 10% of my total production. But, um, but I still get to like climb in my fermenters and I get to play with my amphorae and you know I can do whole cluster and all that kind of silly geeky shit. I can still do that. I can't physically execute every step of it, but at this point I've I've finally like found peace with that. Um, because honestly what that allows me to do is like have a life. And I have a hobby that I'm it's more than a hobby. I mean, I have another thing that I do with a lot of my time that's very meaningful for me too. So, you know, working with the flow of how things operate here and being comfortable with it facilitates, you know, me having other aspects to who I am <laughs> on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think I ever want my own brand. I feel like there are enough here. I want to stay in Oregon and so sort of by definition I don't want my own brand because for fuck's sake if one more assistant winemaker gets some investor to like bankroll their geeky project and then they sell out every year of the 120 cases they made and blast it all over social media like there's some brilliant fucking sorry um <laughs> i just it's there's enough of that there's enough of that um and i don't i don't really have a much of a head for business i, I this situation is actually like, you can actually be pretty weird and geeky even with the big production stuff. You just have to figure out what that looks like. And it took me a minute, but like I got to float my Chardonnay for the first time two years ago. That was dope. Flotation is cool. Like normally you have to wait, you know, five days to cold settle and, but dude, flotation is like three hours and then you reverse rack and then you have all this fluffy foamy leaves and it tastes really good. And like you can, you know, then you can filter the leaves and you get better yields. And, um, I really kind of like the economics of it too. Like I'm not tasked with managing my economics, which is amazing, but I like to uh, not manage them, but well, I can to some extent manage them, but I like to know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So like I've managed to increase my gallons per ton without decreasing quality. Mm -hmm. And that's, that feels like a huge accomplishment. Um, and working with clients, like large retailers that I make private labels for, you know, and how to, earn their trust and produce a consistent product year in and year out. That's something, you know, producing something that's, everybody in Oregon wants to produce something that's consistently wonderful, but most, you know, it was never really a priority before for me to produce something that's the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that is a priority with some of the wines I produce now and it's hard and it's a fun challenge. Um, and it's why I have to source some of my fruit from outside the Willamette Valley. Because this valley is like never the same way twice. And it's, it's not just a little bit never the same way twice, it's like drastically never the same way twice. So um, I definitely don't, and it's funny, you know, I, like I don't, I don't get 
any of that feeling anymore from any of my colleagues or within my own self of being like a sellout. Mm -hmm. Especially because whenever they need to get rid of a thousand gallons of something, who do they call and who's always going to buy it and who always pays the bills? <laughs> this girl. So now it's like, I mean, like, oh my God, what am I going to do with this extra? And they call, yeah, yeah, I'll send a tanker, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like the fucking godfather. <laughs> No, I'm <laughs> you mentioned major retailers, and I know that one, one of your big brands is, is Kirkland. Tell, tell me about that. that they project. are very discriminating. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're a challenging client, not like on, in the sense that they're hard to work with, but they're a challenging client because they have really high standards for how they want things, and they've got a pretty, a very pair of knowledgeable wine buyers. Mm -hmm. um, and you know they drive a hard bargain right because mm -hmm. they want to be able to sell the wine to their customers for i think 14.99 mm -hmm. but they want it to be willamette valley so that adds a whole other fun twist for me because it has to be you know how the appellation requirements are in this region like it has to be 100 percent willamette valley if it says willamette valley on the label mm -hmm. so um you know you have a tough vintage like with the weather and you're really working mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, that's, that's one small portion of my production It's 8,000 cases. So like, you know, that's enough volume where you're working. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, but being that they're so discriminating, um, and I mean, they're involved not heavily. They're, they don't like come here all the time and want to see everything. Like they're they're good to just like receive a sample at certain junctures and you know give me feedback. Um, and it's it's kind of a fun game for me to like see if I can knock their socks off. Um, the, them and the other, you know, I, I do a lot for Whole Foods, mm -hmm. and they're them. I really like trying to knock their socks off because mm -hmm. I do a whole. I do Chardonnay and Pinot Gris and Rosé and Pinot Noir, and like, you know, I, I like to see if I can make them just. <laughs> you know, I did that with the Chardonnay last year. It was pretty awesome. Um, That's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. So those are those are fun, and it's. Um, but it's an extra pressure, right? Because those relationships are very important to my company because inevitably the relationship with those retailers isn't just the, the private label that I'm producing. It's also our other brands that they are selling. And so it's keeping a good relationship with that retailer and making them feel like they're being taken care of and they're being considered. Mm -hmm. um, but also like earning their trust so in order to maintain the autonomy that I like. Mm -hmm. Because right now I have, the only thing I don't have autonomy over is my demand numbers, which is fine. But the winemaking, like it's all me mm -hmm. and that is bananas. Like when I for, first couple of years, I was like, do they know I'm just a fucking kid? Like <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I had that imposter syndrome, you know, like, what am I doing? There's so many gallons. <laughs> um, and it, it's the, it's so dope because we have great resources. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a fucking centrifuge down there. I can centrifuge a 25,000 gallon tank in like 11 hours. I mean, come on, like that's super cool. And we have a fleet of impeller pumps and then another fleet of lobe pumps and like two cross flow filters and a nitrogen generator. You need high pressure nitrogen, you need low pressure nitrogen, just walk to the next wall. There's a quick disconnect, I promise. It's pretty cool. Um, but then there's also, you know, there's, there's the, the amphora and there's two-ton land downstairs where each of the 200 two-ton open tops has its own parking spot with hot and cold glycol and tank net that I can check from home. Um, so having, being the kid with all the toys does not suck mm -hmm. at all. 
and it's like they, they really set before, even before I got here, I don't think they realized how much they set a winemaker up for success. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, obviously I'm always chasing, like, I'm always trying to, like I make single vineyard designate Pinots that are, you know, 200 cases and they're hand harvested and we fucking sort them with tweezers and, you know, I'm exaggerating, but like, we sell them for $64 out of the tasting room and they're, just like all the other wines at that price point qualitatively. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but I'm always chasing that with my sub-20s, mm -hmm. right? Like, that's the goal. Mm -hmm. That kind of concentration, that kind of complexity, you know, that kind of aromatic development, and like, how can I, how can I get there with, a, with machine harvested fruit in a closed top fermenter that goes through a must be? You know, how, how can I do the least amount of amelioration and end up with the best possible product? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then, and then, and then 2020, mm -hmm. which I still have fucking PTSD from. Well, one of the last questions I was going to ask you is about 2020. So let's talk about 2020. <laughs> um, obviously, two big events in 2020. So let's let's talk about the effect the effects of the pandemic and the effects of, of the fires at harvest and, and and how they affected the job you had to do. The pandemic, not much. Um, just you know, masks and temperature checks and hand sanitizer. But my day to day didn't really change at all. Mm -hmm. Um, I had to like, my, my football season got truncated and so that was really hard for me emotionally. Um, so there was some like sanity stuff to deal with, but I have a much better handle on how to deal with those things than I did years ago. So, um, you know, so that's about like the pandemic, it, honestly, for me, emotionally, it wasn't really so much the quarantine. I'm kind of a homebody anyway. Um, it was the other stuff. It was the civil unrest. You know, the Willamette Valley, the wine industry in the Willamette Valley, the wine community is pretty homogenous. It's mostly educated, liberal white people. And honestly, that's mostly what I've grown up around. I didn't realize, I really didn't realize how bad shit is in this country. Mm -hmm. I'm a little embarrassed that I didn't know, but it was, I was sort of bounced between rage and despair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that was hard. Like, it was distracting. Mm -hmm. The election, the, all of that, the people getting killed by police, the shit that's still going on in Portland. I moved out of Portland. That was huge. Um, but the, it, it just really, you know, this is such a little bubble we're, we're in. And it just made me rethink a lot of things, you know? Mm -hmm. And it, 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 just how, how we could treat each other the way that people treat each other. It just, fuck. You need to drink more wine. They need to drink more wine. <laughs> Stop drinking Bush Light. Mm -hmm. Start drinking Pinot. Um, <laughs> Change your whole mindset. Totally. Eat more cheese. Um, so that was, that was hard. Mm -hmm. The election and all, everything leading up to that and the, you know, that we had just opened the tasting room and then it had to close. So it was like all this excitement. We opened November 3rd, 2019. Mm -hmm. And then we had to close. And so we had to let some staff go and we had to, are we going to make it? Like, are we going to get through this? Are we going to have to shut this whole thing down? That was this long process that I've been so excited about. I mean, that tasting room, like that's, that's, they handed me a fucking designer, an interior designer 
Like I was part of selecting where it was and, and I mean, I can't believe how much ownership they've granted me considering the fact that I do not own any part of this company. <laughs> I'm just a W-2 employee, you know, like, but that, that tasting room wouldn't exist if it weren't for me. And that, and so while it's good to remember that everyone is replaceable, um, myself included, it, it, it's just been so, I'm so grateful, I can't believe it, it's so exciting, it hasn't, the novelty of it hasn't worn off. And so, but that, you know, it, there was a lot of, oh God, what's gonna happen? Like, am I, am I still gonna have a job? Do I still have job security? Like, is this company gonna fold? You know, because early on, we didn't know what the fuck was gonna happen. And, and so it was, you know, is it gonna be martial law? Do I need to buy more guns? Like, not that I have a stockpile of guns. Do I need to buy guns? Um, <laughs> We have a little 22, but it's just for play. Um, yeah, so that, that was tough. But none of, it's probably fucked up to say this considering the depth of the civil unrest, but I, I'm just being honest when I say none of that compares to how the fires affected me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I'm still dealing with it. And I had to make these, oh my fuck, God, it was so stressful. It, first, it felt like Armageddon. Like I'm out sampling vineyards and there's ash on my boots and there's ash in my sample buckets and I can't see to the end of the row because the smoke is so thick. Um, I had to make these decisions to whether or not to harvest a vineyard. And I didn't have, you know, I get so much, I have so much fruit contracted that like, and none of my contracts had, I mean, there's force majeure, but so that basically covers it, but it doesn't cover the grower's loss mm -hmm. if we were to walk away from a contract. Mm -hmm. So with each, you know, I didn't have time to, well, and, and the lab was, to, like, there was no lab that could give you data in a reasonable enough amount of time that it could affect your harvest decisions. So even, even the process of a mini ferment might take too long. And so I, I, you know, I got numbers when I could, but I had to make decisions just based on, like, where they, the vineyard sits and whether, like, how thick the layer of ash was. Um, and then you don't know, right? Because the fruit tastes great. You can't, the fruit, you don't know with the fruit. Uh, and so I've been filling tanks and filling tanks. And then, and then some of the big wineries that buy a lot of fruit, one in California and, and one that's based here, but their parent company is also Washington, they, they bounced from a lot of their contracts. Just and what, what are these little growers going to do? Are you going to go into litigation with a chateau? No. So I picked up as many of those as I could. I couldn't get them all. But um, I mean, I, there was one day where I, I think I sent, I constructed, emailed, received, sent for signatures, and then sent back to be executed to the grower, like I think six contracts with a harvest date on those contracts of like three days later. Um, and I think I did all of that. I, that was October 1st was that day. Oh my God. And so I met some new growers, really cool people, beautiful vineyards. I mean, some of the vineyards I got to get my hands on, like I could never afford usually. Mm -hmm. um, and everything, and then, you know, go, the, going through the cellar, like, during ferment, watching it develop, after ferment, after mallow. I had to keep going back and, like, tasting my 19s just to remind myself that I do actually know what I'm doing. Because. <laughs> <laughs> Like some of them have, are, are good. I'm, they're like everything, everything. Don't let anybody tell you that they don't have volatile phenols. 
from the Willamette Valley. Mm -hmm. They're lying or they're stupid. But some of them are below sensory and they stay below sensory and the bound numbers are low enough that you're, you're pretty much good. Um, I, I don't know about in bottle for five years, but for a quick release, you're, you're good. So I have, I have some of that. I have some clean stuff from other regions. And then I've got like my last few tanks that I'm working with. And there, some of them are, are there. They've, they've been transferred onto wood. They're good. They're, you know, I've eliminated enough that I'm below sensory and the wines are still very much Pinot because my approach for 2020 was like, I'm going to make ginormous over extracted fruit bombs so that when I strip the shit out of them with theodorizing carbon, they'll still be Pinot. <laughs> it worked. Um, they're they're kind of just like a normal Pinot from me. You should, but oh my God, like right before they started getting really fucking weird, like right after primary, they were so big. They looked like Syrah. They were gooey, you know, like just glycerol and tannins and like, oh my God. And I, you know, and the alcohols were pretty marginal last year, but um, they, <laughs> they were so big and the back end would just like, rip the enamel off your teeth. You're just, it's like, like I, oh my God, I over, I like, woof. It's shit that I would have, if I, if it was someone else's wine in a normal year and I was tasting it, I would have been like in my head, just Judgy McJudgerson, like you fucking idiot, stop extracting. <laughs> um, but but it, it, it paid off, you know, cause they still smell like Pinot, they look like Pinot, they taste like Pinot. They're a little quiet right now, but I'll take that over what they were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, campfire, matchstick, mint was an interesting one. Um, burnt toast, like burnt toast, burnt grain, mm -hmm. burnt popcorn. Mm -hmm. um, then couple that with vine stress which then caused a lot of reduction during fermentation, regardless of temperature, or feeding, or air, or anything. Just vine stress as expressed through grapes missing, you know, like maybe the methionine cell walls were weak or something because the sun went away for 10 days mm -hmm. during the end of sugar loading. So like, it, it was almost like I could hear them all like, wailing while they fermented, you know. <laughs> oh my God. I fermented at every temperature. Every, I tried everything. I tried all the things. Um, I had, I still have a trial. We've got, we did uh, 10 two-tonners from one vineyard with where we trialed all the different techniques that are in barrel now that we will go back through soon. But I was, yeah, it didn't matter. I'm in seven Ks on trialing. I'm like, okay, this one, we're gonna basically do flash detente without a flash detente device. 95 degrees, bang it through, you know, enzymes, sacrificial tannins, granular oak chips, and punch the shit out of it. But this one, you know, 78 max, and we're only gonna do one day, one a day pulsar. And, we got to pump this one over. The, these guys, because I was the only one doing any production here, they let they were like, "You want to pump over whatever you want. You want to pump over it? We'll do it." And so, so I was pumping over, um, just trying to be a little more gentle and and not. But the, you know, then it became apparent that um, when it comes to the the like, I handpicked as much as I could, but. That wasn't an option for all of it. So it, it became very apparent, not, not when the fruit comes in, but after I'd gotten part of the way through fermentation, that's when you figure out that like, if it's machine harvested, don't try to like be gentle in fermentation because it's too late. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So beat the shit out of it so that it's big. Mm -hmm. um, press cuts, you know, uh, uh, fuck man, it was gonna be a, such an amazing vintage too. Mm -hmm. Like we were on track for it to potentially be the best vintage a lot of us have ever seen here. You know, 
low vineyard economics because we don't have to pay to thin because the nature did it for us mm -hmm. and the temperatures and I mean, oh, so that was pretty tragic. I had, you know, two, my two biggest vineyards down in Silverton, I had to leave, we, well, I would say we left them hang. That's not entirely what we did. We did not harvest them, but on behalf of Vine Health, they just drove the machines through on the floor. And I'm talking about like 400 acres. <sighs> so, you know, I didn't harvest everything, obviously, but but the, a lot of what I, then, you know, I had a, I have two growers that I, I just love them and they're small and that's their everything. And one, I mean, one of them like had to evacuate. That's how close they were. Actually, both of them did, but I brought it in and I pressed it. Gorgeous rosé. Um, I, you know, I cold settled one with carbon and then the other one I floated um, down to like 35 NTUs and golden so no numbers just but so fortunately I have a big rosé program so I could do that and we didn't lose by making sure that they didn't go bankrupt mm -hmm. but, um, but a, a lot of the other stuff you know I made it into Pinot and I ended up I did end up with about 12,200 gallons that I just couldn't with and fortunately we're a large company with a lot of weird projects up in Washington and so I just sent it away. <laughs> and I think, it, I, who knows where it ended up, but they have enough weird big red things that are huge that they can lose it in that and it doesn't matter. So, um, that's a nice thing to have. Very, very, but, oh man, I was, you know, I'd have people come down to taste and I mean, I'd let them taste. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if I had it to do over, I don't know, man. There are a few decisions I probably would have made different. Like I wouldn't, I think I wouldn't have tried to be light handed on anything. Mm -hmm. Those tank, the tanks that I tried to be light handed with, I, I wouldn't have done that. If I could, if I could do it over, I would just beat the shit out of everything. Because the ones that I did, that you know, they're not less smelly, but they're not really more smelly. <laughs> they're, but they're just a, they they handled the treatment mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they came out on the other side, basically being like a normal Pinot. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, what, in order to prepare them for bottle. Like I have enough actually below sensory stuff that I can actually bottle, like legitimately bottle a Willamette Valley for Kirkland and I can bottle a Oregon for Cloudvale for Whole Foods, but um, I'm gonna you know, shave my numbers down obviously. I'm not doing any of the single vineyard designates. I'm not doing any reserved here. Mm -hmm. So I get why people didn't harvest because if all you do is that, mm -hmm. like you can't in good conscience sell someone a $75 bottle of Pinot and be like, yeah, put it on your cellar. Because no. <laughs> Just no. Sure. Um, so I get it. But, you know, if, if it's a $20, if it's a $16, $15 Pinot that's going to release five months after bottling and be sold out a year after that, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And when it comes time to prepare for bottling, you know, um, it's going to be like kind of the opposite of natural wine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, it's just a different beast. Like I've, I've been really fortunate. Mm -hmm. I've had really good fruit and I haven't had to deal with that and mm -hmm. hopefully never again, but mm -hmm. who knows. So I have one final question for yes. you. And we have, we have to talk about football. Oh, okay. So you brought it up earlier. You're kind yeah. of say your second passion. So tell, tell me about it and, and about how it's gone for you. Yeah. Um, so I play for the Oregon Ravens, and we are a member of the WNFC, the Women's National Football Conference. There are 28 teams. 
There are other, I, when I started playing football, I was playing for a team in the WFA. So that's the Women's Football Alliance, and that's actually the oldest league that's still around in the country, and there's like 60-something teams mm -hmm. and, and three divisions. But the WNFC is sponsored by Adidas and Rydell and United Sports Brands, and um, it's more competitive. Mm -hmm. Like there are definitely some teams in the WFA, like out in Boston, DC, where they're legit, like they're hardcore. But across the board, the WNFC is more competitive. Um, and I am a corner mm -hmm. and a running back and slot receiver. It's full contact, NCAA rules, so knee down, you're down, not down by contact like the NFL, which I forgot about the other day when we were practicing kick return. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah. Um, but she didn't touch me, Sarah. Uh, it's, oh, it's amazing. It's a wonderful group of women. It's such an incredible sport. Like I, I got into it because <laughs> when I stopped drinking, I, I had to like, you know, I had, I had to like redirect this tense energy and, you know, figure out other ways to manage my emotions and like stabilize myself. Mm -hmm. And so I went, I threw myself head first into fitness. And so that led to obstacle course races, Spartan races, that kind of thing. And then, I'm, I'm also fanatical about football as a spectator, mm -hmm. college and NFL. I mean, like, it's bad, <laughs> which is hard because it's during harvest, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I, I'm, I find a way, one earbud, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, and I, so I'd gotten to this point with my fitness where like, like oh, I was yoked. Actually, kind of am right now. Um, and <laughs> it's, well, our first game is on Saturday, so. Um, and I'm watching, and I'm like, I want to do that. You know, fuck, like that is just so that sport. Like, there's nothing like football. The strategy, the ferocity. You know, reading a defense, reading an offense, like. How to the things you have to be able to do with your body that it's I mean they're gladiators it's it's amazing and I like had built myself into a wee little gladiator and so I was like dude I I can do that I know I can do that and um, it's definitely harder than it looks and it hurts mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of bruises. I'm fortunate I haven't had any major injuries, but I've witnessed a number of them. But it's, oh my God, it's so incredible. It's just, it's just like what the guys do, you know? It's just, but we're, but we're women, so we didn't grow up playing it. So if you're a rookie to this, you're a rookie to the sport. Mm -hmm. And, so the pace is different. Obviously, we're women, so the pace is different because we can't run as fast as men. We're fast, but not as fast as men. We're not as big as men. So I, it's kind of like, you know, I'd say it's probably like a, a decent JV team from a high school, kind of like that, only, again, you know, 16-year-old boys are fast as fuck. Um, so our, like a good 40 time for a woman is like anywhere between like a four, eight, and a five, two. That's like top, top, top 40 times. Um, and, but like we, we have combines, broad jump, high jump, you know, like we do the L drill, we do like, we do 40s and um, we use a TDY, so it's the youth size football. So it's the next size down from the college one. Um, and it's, yeah, man, it's, it's a regular size field. Everything else is the same. It's all NCAA rules. And it's, just, it's like, it's just this group of crazy people because to, to like be a grown up who has like a job and a family and to choose to do this to yourself 
you're a nutcase. <laughs> so like, it's this group of, of this motley crew of weirdos who have decided to do this thing that's very much like going into battle mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. together and like only sort of knowing what they're doing. And it's uh, funny enough, like I'm one of the only players on the team who's actually really obsessed with football. A lot of them are not. They don't even like know the rules. I mean, they do now, but so everybody gets into it for a different reason, but like pound for pound, we hit us hard. Like I'm little, so I get lit up. <laughs> like, but I kind of like it. Because um, if you're in really good shape, you just kind of bounce. Um, tackling, you know, I, like it's, it's incredible. It's, it hurts a little bit sometimes if you do it wrong. It's really easy to do it wrong, but like <laughs> it's fun. And, and then, you know, like strapping into that shit, like pads and the, all the, you know, especially before a game in the locker room, like we have this like pregame music and it's, it's like all the things that I would daydream about, you know, watching the guys, watching the combine and watching the draft and watching pro days and all the college games and all the rivalries. And like we, our rival is in Seattle, of course. And um, they're bitches, they're all bitches. You know? <laughs> they're not, but like, you know, it's, it's that rivalry, right? Like the, our thing is she flies with her own wings. That's the state motto and um, Ravens. Mm -hmm. Their thing is bow to the crown. So they're the majestics, you know, so we kind of, you know, like, Kind of like how like mm -hmm. Longhorns and Sooners, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> take your crown. Uh, <laughs> it's dope. It's it makes me feel like a kid. You know, I don't have kids and I can't have kids, and so I have dogs. Mm -hmm. And so because I have not been a parent, I have no plans for that. Um, I'm still a kid. And then also I think like during if you're if you're like self-medicating with, with a substance, it kind of stops your emotional development in a lot of ways. And so I'm still kind of catching up with where I actually am in my physical age. So in a lot of ways, I, I feel much younger than I am. And so it's, and I'm fangirl about like, I have a, I have a diamond grill like Alvin Kamara. <sighs> no shit, like it's dope. <laughs> And I have socks that say bye on the back. And I mean, it's like the stuff that you would do if you were a 14 year old boy, seriously. Um, I mean, I'm like this far from like an Alvin Kamara poster on my wall in my house. Like um, I watch all I do, like my, my use of social media is basically just watching football videos on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So like, training drills and you know I follow different players and just I, I have ladders and mini hurdles and cones like all over my backyard and in my car and I turned my third bedroom into a gym fully like rubber floors big mirrors squat rack all the shit um, yeah man it's I don't know why it I don't know what but like I I could easily like cry talking about it like that's how strongly I feel and I don't know why mm -hmm. um, but it just it does the thing mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. that thing that people need it does that thing mm -hmm. it's like the it's all and it's intimate too like the relationship that you have with your teammates is intimate because you're it's a lot like battle so it's a lot like a I mean I've never been in the armed forces but I would imagine it's a much gentler version of you know being in a like a platoon mm -hmm. and so so it actually, I mean, you know, oxytocin, serotonin, adrenaline, like all those things that you need to be emotionally healthy. And then I'm very competitive. So, <laughs> so it's, you know, like the other, the, the other running back on the team is um, just, just a gift to human race. I mean, like she's just genetically gifted. She's like a no shit. She's like a girl version of Derrick Henry. I'm not exaggerating. And and like, so she, like so 
everything I do, she's the bar I set it mm -hmm. against, mm -hmm. right? And you need that teammate. You need that person. So like we get along, but we don't like hang out and we're not like super chummy. We're very respectful and we admire one another, but, the, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, and I fucking love that. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, yeah, and it's, I don't know, man, it's a lot, it's a lot like winemaking, honestly. Like, just to, to read, to read the, the thing, to read the challenge and make the right choice. Um, and then just, I mean, the first few times you get hit, like in a game, by someone who isn't on your team, when you, like, and you're, I'm little, like I said, so the first time I got lit up, like airborne, you know, I've never been in a fight, but like, you get lit up a couple times, and you're like, bitch, I'm gonna fucking kill you. <laughs> like, give me those ankles, because I'm little, so <laughs> got <an> ankle tackle. Strategically, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it, like it brings out, I don't know, I've, I've always really, I, I, love, I have big dogs, and I've always really, I have two German Shepherds, I've always really admired the humans who are still very connected to the fact that we're animals. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's very sad that that seems to dwindle as the generations come. And so doing, you know, when I was doing those obstacle races, that was part of what I loved about that was like, this is, this is kind of, you know, it's a silly version, but this is like what human animals did back when they were hunting and gathering and like scrabbling over things to like find shelter and back when it was simple because everything was just a matter of the biological imperative mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and i i'm not i would say i missed that i sound like i ever experienced it but like i wish that we made more decisions based on the biological imperative rather than all the other shit. And it just, it makes me feel alive, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? Cause, like, when I first told, <laughs> when I went to go find, so I stopped drinking, I went to, I joined a gym and I found a trainer. So I didn't know how to like gym. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he's like, you know, sits down with me and does all my BMI and everything. And then he's like, so, you know, what's your motivation? And, and what I told him, I, no shit, verbatim, was I want to be able to survive a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> he's like, dope, that's a good reason. <laughs> like, I want to be able to run away and climb over and jump high and, you know, and, and like, it all, it all, all of it kind of ties into this, to this sense of confidence in myself. So whether it's my winemaking decisions or my physical ability to do what I need to do, mm -hmm. and and it, it all sort of. It, it just helps me stay in touch with the organic part of being alive. Mm -hmm. um, because when you're on a field during a game, or even like during a scrimmage, you're not thinking about anything else. Because you gotta keep your head on the swivel, right? Like, they're coming for you. So, it, it just, it's, it keeps things simple mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because like so many people in the world are doing what I'm doing, but it's Madden. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> put some pads on, motherfucker. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> it just, and then it also, it's, it's, um, it ends up being helpful to sell wine because everybody wants to hear about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, like you think, you know, it's, it's not the lingerie league. Like we're, we're fully clothed in uniforms <laughs> and everything. And, um, I'm number 21, I got, I got the number I wanted, you know, prime time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was never even a Niners fan, but like, he was the shit. Mm -hmm. So, 
yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's this the, this part of my childhood. Some of it comes from having grown up with body dysmorphia and like feeling I was a chubby kid and just that was fucking awful, and that carried into my adulthood and and so it's just this confidence, this sense of like feeling comfortable mm -hmm. in my work and in my skin and in my decisions and in my relationships and like yeah it, it's taken some bruises to get here literal mm -hmm. blood sweat and tears mm -hmm. uh, but I'm pretty fortunate now mm -hmm. yeah well that's that's incredible and I have many more questions for you, but I know we've taken a lot of your time, so we will, we will stop for today. Maybe we'll come back and do a part two sometime. Sure. But thank you so much for your time, for your stories, yeah. for all of your thoughts and your candor, and we will go and let you off the hook. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>